There is nobody like you. A lot of people will say, oh, well, there's somebody else talking about the things that I'm talking about. You know, the truth is there is only one you and you have a unique perspective. You've got a unique sort of way of delivering and cadence and your audience will find you. Hey guys, Nathan here. Welcome back to another interview. If you'd like to know what it takes, how to start, grow, or scale your YouTube channel into the millions of subscribers, you're in for an absolute treat. Today, we're speaking with Aaron Marino, and his company, Alpha M, has over 6 million YouTube subscribers, and you're gonna get a full masterclass on what's working, what's not working, and how he has over 6 million plus followers. So Aaron, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today. The first question I ask everyone that comes on is, how did you get your job, aka how did you find yourself doing the work you're doing today? So when I was about 12 years old, I went and worked out at a gym for the first time and that really like changed my life. Um, I came from an abusive, you know, sort of stepfather situation and so my self-esteem at that age was really like bad. And um, I, I watched the movie Rocky Four. I saw these guys that just looked amazing. And I'm like, hey, if I can look like that, that's what I want to do. And so I, I went to the gym at 12 years old. And really, that's where I found my confidence and, and everything sort of, you know, in terms of, you know, just personally and personal development, I felt amazing going to the gym. And so I knew from the age of 12 that that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, went to college, got out of college, moved to, uh, to a city outside of, uh, or actually right in Atlanta, in Georgia, in the U.S., and uh, met a guy. We opened a nutrition store, actually, and, um, and I, I did not love the nutrition store business. One of the other things that was a bit of an issue is that um, our morals and ethics were not aligned. And I realized that if I continued to work there, I would probably end up in jail. And uh, I knew that for a fact that, it, you know, in prison, I would, be, uh, I would be popular, but I would not thrive. And so I ended up leaving and uh, getting a job at a, a health club as a personal trainer and uh, met a woman while I was at the nutrition store, helped her lose 100 pounds. And, and she asked if, she, if I wanted to open a, a fitness center with her. And I said, absolutely, this is my dream. And so we did. Unfortunately, we signed the lease on September 11th, as in like the September 11th, uh, the one where the planes were crashing into the World Trade Center. That should have been an omen as to how that business was going to unfold in, in a you know, fiery, horrible mess. Ended up fil filing bankruptcy in 2006. And uh, from there, it was, it was a, 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 an issue because I'm like, okay, what do I do now? I literally didn't have a plan B. I'm the type of, of entrepreneur where, you know, it's plan A all the time until, you know, I guess there, you have to figure out another direction, another course. And so um, I had no idea what I was going to do. And it was the lowest point in my life. I'm, you know, in my 30s. And I just had a failed business. I filed bankruptcy. I was driving a beer cart at a country club. Um, and I didn't know what to do. So one thing kind of led to another and I thought, okay, well, what business can I start with very little, actually like no money? And I said, well, I maybe could do like image consulting. At the time when I had my fitness center, there was a guy that I met and uh, he was going out on a date and he's like, hey, what do I wear? I'm like, well, I actually have an idea. And while we're at it, why don't I take you shopping, go through your wardrobe and then We'll, uh, we'll go get your hair cut because your, your, you know, your hair is crazy and your nose hairs need to be trimmed. I didn't realize it, but I was kind of building the, the model of a business, image consulting. And so when I, when I didn't know what to do, I decided to give that a try. I started a website and um, started advertising on Google with Google AdWords. And this was back when you could actually bid and, and only pay a few dollars for a keyword. And so I was starting to get clients you know, flying from all over the country. And uh, 2008, my wife, uh, or 2007, my wife gave me a video camera for Christmas. And I thought, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's a bigger audience out there. Maybe there are more people who just want real world advice about how to look better. And, you know, that is not like GQ or Esquire, because at the time, you know, there really wasn't much in terms of resources for regular guys just to get solid basic advice on and what to wear and how to groom themselves. And so I decided to just put a video up on YouTube and I didn't know what I was doing up until that point. I'd only been on YouTube twice. And so I, uh, I posted a video and, um, and I got a comment from somebody asking me, 
hey, you know, I, I, I'm a bigger guy. What should I wear? Any tips? And it was at that moment that I was hooked. It's like, all right. And I realized at that point that what I was really searching for my whole life was to feel validated and to feel like I mattered and that my opinion, opinion mattered. And so that was kind of how it all sort of started and, and how I find myself today still doing YouTube videos, um, you know, many, many years later. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Aaron. I, I really appreciate your, your vulnerability and just being so open around your story. So the next question I have for you is just like, what does it actually take to build a YouTube channel to have, you know, over 6 million subscribers like yours? You know, it's funny. When I started, I had no idea. When I started back in 2008, there wasn't really this idea that you could make money at it. It was just something that you did because you had something you wanted to share. Um, and then it literally took me, I, I believe, I mean, I didn't make any money on my YouTube channel for, I believe, five or six years, like none. I, I think I started trying to sell like e-products like a like i came up with something called the male style guide i'm like all right well maybe i can sell this and and i'm just not really the information product guy it's just not something i've ever been really great at i've always been more passionate and excited about like physical products right and so um yeah it was i think about five or six years before i ever made any money it took me i believe nine years to get my first million subscribers and um it was you know just sheer just con consistency honestly i mean it wasn't you know people always talk about like an overnight success or was there a video that really like you know made you go viral or anything like that for me it was just simply i was first online in terms of in the space talking about men's style and grooming and i just kept doing it kept posting it it was this itch that i just kept scratching and you know, lo and behold, um, you know, 13 years later, you know, this is where we are. Now, the good news for those that are listening, it is much easier now to grow your YouTube channel than it was when I started. Um, and YouTube is actually really rewarding newer, fresh content creators and helping them almost grow and, and get in front of the audience that you need to find. The algorithm has gotten incredibly intelligent and um and better at sort of connecting the dots and so if you've got something to say if you've got something you want to basically share put it out there you know the thing that really holds the most people most people back when i when i talk to people i'm like hey if you've got something to say if you've got a business start a youtube channel it literally costs you nothing to put content out other than your time maybe there's a little bit of a learning curve but the thing that really holds people back is just they, they worry that they're not going to be perfect or that they're going to look funny or, or you know, they're, they're kind of like scared to, to just give it a shot. And I am telling you, after 13 years, I still get upset at some of the videos that I make and it's not as good as I wish it would be. But you just got to get started. You just got to put something out there, put that first video out there, and then, then you'll be amazed at what actually happens if you just keep posting content. Yeah, I see. So... Um, I'm curious as well, like you said that uh, for the first five, six years, you didn't make any money. So nothing from AdSense. What did you do in that in between time? Like, how did you keep going? Oh, that was just, uh, it was something where I was still doing the image consulting um, on the side. And I was also, um, I was also, you know, doing actually some personal training still. I, I was a, I'm a personal trainer. It's what I love doing. Fitness is my it was kind of like my life. And so I was still moonlighting as a personal trainer, doing the image consulting. And that's kind of, you know, YouTube was just kind of my hobby that I would do on Fridays where I would, you know, film a video and upload it. And, and, and uh, it was interesting when I started, um, I was real. I, I, I think I was dealing with a lot of issues. And so for the first like few years of posting videos, most of the videos I was doing were, I was actually drinking while I was doing it. And so I would highly not recommend doing that. But yeah, I was, I was literally drunk for the first like five years of YouTube. <laughs> and then I got sober. <laughs> so <laughs> if I can do it, anyone can do it. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. So, so, so what, at what point did you go, okay, this is like go all in on YouTube and start to gain serious traction. I'd love to hear the tipping point because you talk about consistency. So the, for the past 13 years, have you always done one video a week at minimum or what, what does that look like? When I started the first few years, it was one video a week. And that was like, that was, that was the goal. And that's, I think kind of the, 
the general rule of, of posting content. Now, you know, if your content is super over, you know, high production value and there's a lot of, you know, moving parts, some people, uh, you know, post twice a month, but it really just, you've got to figure out that, that cadence that you can continue to do consistently. You know, a lot of people will get started, they'll be gung ho, they'll put it out there and they'll go really strong for like a month and then they'll go two weeks without posting or three weeks without posting. This is a, a not, that, that is a, that is a misguided strategy. You've just got to find something that, that you can do. And if that is just once every twice or twice a week or once a month, that's fine. But for me, it was one video a week is what I would put out. And then I guess it, once I started to, you know, sort of, you know, I, I started to get like some, a sponsor. I actually, I got my first sponsorship. Somebody reached out to me and said, Hey, you know, would you be interested in, in putting sort of like a, a, a pre-roll on your video and we'll pay you a hundred dollars a month. I was like, wow, hundred dollars a month for just me putting like your logo on the front of my video. Absolutely. And then I started, you know, getting more people that were content or contacting me. And, and so the frequency started to increase. Um, once I sort of hit that like six year mark, that's when, um, maybe seven, year seven, that's when I was starting to really get contacted often and frequently by companies wanting me to promote and talk about their products. And that's when kind of I, I, I realized, oh, wait a second, I can actually make some money doing this. And, um, and that's kind of when I went all in. And, um, you know, it was kind of, it was, it was amazing. I mean, people were actually paying me to talk about their products. And um, it, was, it was incredible. And so that's, you know, I guess how I made the transition from moonlighting, doing it as a hobby to doing it full time professionally. Yeah. So it took you about five, six years to go all in. And at that point in time, what was your subscriber count? How much time were you spending on the channel? Was it more? Yeah, you said it was a hobby. hobby. Like what, what did that look like in the early days? Just to give people context. In the early days, it wasn't much. I didn't really understand what I was doing. It's, it's much more of like a job now, obviously. Um, you know, at the time I was putting in, I was doing all my editing. I was figuring that out. And so I would say, you know, on average a week I was putting in, you know, four hours a week, maybe. I mean, not that much. Um, it's when I started to, you know, really turn the corner. That's when everything started to escalate and scale in terms of my workload and, and how much time I was actually putting in, you know, but like I said, it really depends on the type of content that you're putting out and how much, you know, research goes into whatever you're doing and sort of your process. There is no formula, unfortunately, that, that says, okay, if you do X, Y, and Z, this is how it's going to be. This is how long it's going to take. And this is how you're going to grow and be successful. There are some, some best practices and things that you can do in order to help yourself. But, um, but in terms of time, it's, it's as much as you want to give, but you will get out what you, what you decide to put in. Hmm. So how has the game changed? Like you, you said, you said before that um, a lot has changed. I'd love to delve a bit deeper, like back in the day to now and, and kind of really tap into, you know, someone with over 6 million subscribers. Like, what are you thinking about? What are you doing? Like, yeah. So it, what's really changed is now people know that you can actually make money at it. And so when, when I started, it was simply just for the, the experience of uploading and sharing an idea message or whatever you're talking about. But in the past, you know, five years, six years, seven years, everybody now knows that if you have a successful channel, you can make a lot of money. And so that has really changed the game in terms of the way that people sort of approach the platform. If you've got a business, if you've got e-products, if you've got, you know, a physical tangible product, you know, even an Amazon store, like whatever it is, people go in hoping and no, you know, or I should say with the objective of making it a full-time thing or scaling it and making money off of it. And so I think the purity of the platform has changed slightly and people's motivations have definitely changed. Now, the downside is that if you are going in there and starting a channel with the mindset of from day one, I am going to try to drive a message, drive people to a landing page, make them sign up. Like if you, if you are not giving value but, and you're too hard selling and you're not really I think, you know, connecting or resonating with your audience, it's going to be a harder road. Uh, people have gotten very good at sniffing out 
um, authenticity and inauthenticity. And so the more authentic you are, the more, you know, real, you know, one a quick story about me. I, when I started, was sort of looking at YouTube and looking at some of these successful creators. And I thought that I needed to be outlandish. I thought I needed to curse. I needed, I thought I needed to be racy. And so I actually started trying to do that. And, and some of the things I was saying was definitely out of bounds. Um, and what ended up happening was the moment I actually dropped the act and just got authentic and real and let people see that, you know, I have emotions and I get sad and, and let them sort of into who I was as a person. That's really when everything got better. And since then I have actually deleted a lot of the old videos and content that I produced and created because I'm just embarrassed of the, the person that I presented myself to be and some of the things that I said. And so it's an evolution. And, and for me, you know, YouTube has, has caused me to be a better person, honestly. I mean, it's not that I was like a horrible like person before, but I am ultra aware. Once you have that audience, once you have this following, I feel like you owe it to them in order to not just walk the walk, but, but you know, or not just talk the talk, but walk the walk. And, and trying to perpetrate yourself as one thing online and something else in real life, that was something that was not something I could do. And so it forced me to sort of up my game and to kind of, you know, get my shit together, if you will. And so YouTube has, has changed my life and in, in more than just, you know, professionally, it's been a, a personal, personal and, and spiritual journey for me as well. Yeah. Wow. Um, that's really interesting. So it sounds like for you, um, what's been a real catalyst and maybe do you think a step change in the growth of your channel was when you were just yourself? A hundred percent. And that's the thing that I want to stress to everybody listening. There is nobody like you. A lot of people will say, oh, well, there's somebody else talking about the things that I'm talking about or, or that I want to talk about. You know, the truth is there is only one you and you have a unique perspective. You've got a unique sort of way of delivering and cadence and you will, your audience will find you. Just start, put yourself out there and be as real and open and as honest as you can. Because like I said, you know, people can and the audience will sniff out when you are authentic. And on the flip side, they will also sniff out or sniff out when you're not. And so if you, you know, are just real and yourself, I mean, that is what people are going to tune in for. And they will ride with you. You know, they'll roll with you through thick and thin and you screwing up and doing bad videos. Like if, if you are, if you are you and they fall in love with you and subscribe to you, the person, you know, you could, you can, you know, ride it as, as long, as far and as high as you want to. Yeah, I see. And 2021 right now, what are some other things that the people need to consider? Um, where if they're starting a channel and want to grow it to get meaningful growth like like yourself. So what I my number one tip for people, if you are starting a YouTube channel and you want to hack the system, here it is. Ready? Write this down. If there is somebody or people in your space or talking about some but something with similar content, what what you should do is go to their channel and look for their most popular video. You can actually sort people's content by views. Look for the most popular content that they've done and then do your version of that topic because you know if it got popular for them, chances are people are searching for it. Chances are, um, you know, you are going to, you know, sort of climb and, and really break out of that algorithm. And so, it's, it's a quick and easy thing. And you see a lot of creators doing this. It's, it's these topics that obviously are, are, have high search volume that are engaging with people. And, and so if you've, got a, if you've got something to say, just say it in your, your voice. You don't necessarily need to copy what they say, but look at them, look at their most popular videos and then do your version of that topic and see what happens. Mm, love it. And um, do you copy the exact... Do you model or use the exact thumbnail, text, and title? I don't see why. If it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I would say that um, you can play around with that. But I mean, yeah, I mean, if, if it was popular for somebody else in your space, um, chances are it'll be popular for you. And that's a way for you to sort of, you know, yeah, I, I would say yes. If you want to grow, do it. And do it in your way. Obviously, don't copy their thumbnail in terms of, you know, plagiarizing their thumbnail, but you know, do your version, make it your own. And, and, um, but yeah, copy the, copy the title, copy the thumbnail style, 
or what they're using. And, um, and you see it, you see it a lot. And a lot of these, you know, if you do a search for something, you know, like uh, I'm just trying to think off the top, like there's some, some channels like top think and some of these like kind of, you know, cheesy channels that will, um, you know, just put out a lot of content. And if you look, they'll have, you know, they'll basically everybody's copying the exact same thumbnail, the exact same title, and then they'll do it again and just change, you know, a word or the flow of the, of the, of the title. And it's, I mean, don't reinvent the wheel. I mean, you can, but that's going to be a harder, slower process as opposed to just looking at what's popular. Now I'm not saying to do exclusively that content, but I would probably say, you know, integrate some of your own or different things with some of the things that you know or that have been proven to work. Mm, yeah, no, that's interesting. And when you talk about this strategy, I guess there is some context too. Like if if you want to be a vlogger, right, let's say, and you look at, for example, you know, David Dobrik's top video, it might not have the same context if you did the same no. <laughs> title and thumbnail, and I think, right? I think vlogging is a different, so that is a different animal. Vlogging is, is different than the type of content that I'm talking about. You know, it's tough. If you want to just vlog, okay, well then just share whatever you want to share and, and hopefully, you know, you, you find your audience. The type of content I'm talking about is if you're into finance or you want to start a finance channel or you want to start a you know, a marketing channel or whatever it is. If it's something specific or niche, that's what I'm talking about. Vlogging is different just because it's really dependent upon you, what you're doing. And so that's not necessarily something that you can really copy um, or, or model after, but you could definitely gain inspiration from styles and editing and, and things that have worked for some of these other people. But yeah, no, that's the, that's the wild card is vlogging. That's definitely very personal to to the individual in the channel mm. and we like I, I the trend that i see and i'm curious to hear you your the trend that you see the it's all about creators wanting to basically talk about a, a topic they are passionate about really not so much look vlogging is is very very hard but it's it's welcome welcoming you in you, you into that well, it's welcoming yourself into that, per, into your, it's welcoming that person into your world when it's vlogging versus here's how you do X, here's how you do Y. This is what I've learned. Like, yeah, no, you're hundred percent right. And one of the interesting things and in challenge with vlog, you know, there's, there's, there's upsides and downsides to every style. Vlogging is great because it can be very like loose and the flow doesn't need to be super structured, but on the downside, it does require you to basically divulge, you know, a lot about your life, honestly. I mean, and that's one of the, you know, that's one of the downsides to vlogging is that you are a lot of times then searching and you're almost trying to outdo yourself. And so you're always having to, you know, seek new, exciting, outrageous things. And that can be a drain. And what happens if you just want to take a week off? You don't feel like filming the wedding or the birth of your child, but you feel obligated because you know that you need the views, you know that you need to put out content. You know, on the flip side, doing something that is more targeted and niche, as in like you have a, you know, you're an artist or you're a singer or whatever it may be, you know, it, that really just takes you being disciplined enough to basically think through a, a format, plan it, shoot it, edit it, put it out there on a consistent basis. But it does take a little bit of the, of the of the ease of the vlog away mm. so switching gears for someone that has a channel but perhaps they're you know not seeing the growth that they they would be looking for what advice would you give them to turn it around you know that's what that's a great question because i think all creators struggle from time to time in terms of growth everybody does um you know it's it's look at your what were the popular things that you have done? What does your audience really like? And then try to give them that because, you know, in terms of growth, the way that it works is when you put out a video, if your audience, the people that have subscribed and watch your videos consistently don't watch it, YouTube isn't going to recommend it to new people. But if you can find something that they, you know, that your audience likes, you know, maybe it's, you know, like, like if they love pizza, give them pizza because the chances are, you are going to then increase your likelihood or chances that the algorithm will then show it to people 
that are not your audience. And that's ultimately what you need to do in order to grow. You know, your audience really is the, the benchmark at which the algorithm measures future success of videos that you're putting out. Mm. That's awesome. So um, let's just say you have a channel that has, you know, a few thousand subscribers. Besides the content itself, are there any other, um, like, besides topic ideation, is there any other things that people should be thinking about, whether it's focusing on YouTube search, whether it's getting in suggested, whether it's uh, split testing your thumbnails and your titles, like anything there as well? Number one most important thing is your thumbnail. It doesn't like content, what you're saying, you know, that, that basically will keep them there, but it is all about that thumbnail. Second most important is the title of the video. Uh, but thumbnail, ultimately, because that is what people see. That is what is going to set you apart out on the right-hand side or recommended or, you know, the search, you know, results. So thumbnail is number one most important thing. Topic, title, what I, I would say is second. And then your content, obviously, because if you get a very high click-through, a lot of people click it, but then they, they tune out real quick and they leave. That is telling the, the YouTube algorithm, okay, this is not something that is really interesting or engaging. You really want to shoot for, once you have them in, a, a substantial watch time. How long can you keep them? Because that is ultimately going to tell YouTube that the video that they are recommending is relevant to the searches and to everything that is happening. And so it's about thumbnail first, topic second, watch time third. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. So... How has your thumbnail strategy uh, changed over the years? And talk me through how it's evolved to what it is now and the thinking process behind it. We'd love to hear what, what you found is working from data, from, a, from an analytics perspective. Yeah, yeah, that's an incredible question and something that I think you're always going to be, you know, sort of testing and struggling. In the old days, when I first started and there weren't a lot of people and I wasn't competing with as many videos on specific topics i could literally just have myself and then the text on the screen nothing really engaging and it would you know it would do well because it was a topic that there wasn't a lot of people talking about now you're competing for eyeballs you're competing for for everything and so now it's gotten much more clickbait like you really need that like you know catch your attention you know very dramatic um you know some at times racy thumbnails um, that a little bit are you're typically going to be a little bit more polarizing, but it's all about grabbing that attention because like I said, you're competing with all of these eyeballs for that watch time. And so it's, it's changed in terms of um, just the, in, just trying to really, you know, get people to click. So I would say it's gotten more clickbaity. <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry, that's not a good answer. I just, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's the reality. I mean, I, I know pretty much immediately when I make a thumbnail, okay, this, you know, is, is more outrageous. This is going to definitely do better in terms of views than something that's more safe. And, um, but you've just got to find what's right for you. And, um, and, and there is no right or wrong. And how do you balance that? Because if you have a really aggressive clickbaity thumbnail, but maybe don't deliver on the promise when people watch the video, then your watch time is affected. How are you balancing that? Oh yeah, no, you've got to do a clickbaity video that connects and, and resonates with the content that you're actually putting out. And so, um, you know, something else I would say is if you're doing a video, instead of trying to wait for, you know, delivering really good information, a lot of times people will be like, oh, I'm just going to lead them on and then I'm going to try to get that watch time and I'm going to give them better tips or better information as the video goes. That I, is something that I used to do. What I've come to realize is you really need to give them some good value up front to keep them watching as opposed to waiting and, and you know, and, and trying to sort of, you know, stretch it out and, and, oh, I'll get to this eventually. No, you've got to give them something good up front, keep them hooked or get them hooked and then, and then keep them watching. That's a, a bit of a better strategy in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. And when it comes to CTR, like, um, you know, when it comes to thumbnail, what is something that someone can do watching this right now to improve their CTR today? Like you talk about clickbait, but like anything, 
actionable quick wins that, that they could implement um, or, or can you can we elaborate on on anything there you know vibrant colors are definitely you know better the reds and the greens right that's something that you know if you look at at youtube thumbnails a lot of people use those two colors red and green the reason is because that color catches your attention quicker than you know the blues and the the yellows and the softer colors and so red and green that's something that you know you can do pretty much right away um to increase the 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 ctr of of your thumbnail is use some type of of color schematic and even if it's like a word or a a red box with white lettering in it or a green box with with white lettering if you look around and do a search for a specific video a lot of times you will see those two colors come come to fruition or be present very often and there's a reason for that yeah awesome and that's a great one. And when it comes to the video going live, what is your goal CTR and what is your goal audience retention or watch time? Like what, what is it for you to go, you know what, this video is going to take off versus maybe I'll swap in the thumb, a different thumbnail or change the title or even do you do that? Yeah, I, I do. I will switch it. If it's underperforming and I have two thumbnails, um, usually it's funny. I will send I develop two thumbnails typically for each of my videos, sometimes three. And then I have people that I just send them to and, and like my friends that are kind of like in my demo. And it's simply a question, better question mark. And they'll tell me and I'll send that to, you know, quite a few people. Um, there's also a tool called Thumblytics. If you guys are not familiar with it, are you familiar with that? No, no. Okay. So this is a pretty cool thing that I, I started using and it's, it's, it's a great tool. Um, they're not 100% correct, but basically the way that it works for $5, you can test up to three different thumbnails. You can test different titles and it's with real people. And, um, you know, they'll ask, they'll show this to like, I think it's like 50 people or something like that. And, um, and you know, it will give you kind of like a, a, a result in terms of, okay, well, this one got 73% of the, of the, of the people click this one versus, you know, 20, you know, 7% of the on the other thumbnail. And so it's, it's a tool that I've been using for a little while. And it's just kind of like, if I'm questioning it, I, a lot of times will send it there just to see, Hey, you know, what's happening and, and what is my gut right? Or what does it look like? Now, the one thing you do have to realize is that when using something like that, you, it's good to test two very similar thumbnails. Like if there's the same image, but maybe different text or it's the layout is slightly different that is going to give you a much better accurate, more accurate read on which thumbnail is better. Sometimes the people have a difficult time when it's obvious, you know, the, the thumbnails are very, very different in terms of if, you know, you've got a pig and you've got a dog, you know, it really is a lot of times going to depend on that specific person. They are also, I believe they're, they're foreign. I, I, I'm sure it's from some Asian country um, that they're actually, um, that the audience or the people that they're getting to actually look at these and give you feedback. But the other thing is they do give you feedback in terms of why they like this thumbnail better than the other thumbnail. And so it's a really cool tool. It's something for $5, you can test it. And, and for me, it's been, it's been a benefit. And so if you don't know about it, check it out. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's a great tip. Thanks, man. And, um, are you able to talk through some more metrics? Like what kind of CTR do you, are you aiming for when you and like if it doesn't hit this when do you swap it out and how long do you wait i know immediately within the first like five minutes i know how that video is going to do i mean you the the really cool thing is that now you've got in the uh, creator studio app for your phone i mean you publish a video it sends it out in real time. You're looking to see like what's happening and you can see, okay, this many people hit it the first minute and the second minute and you can watch and track. And so, you know, if it's not doing well right away, once you have a little bit of history. So for me, a good CTR is generally around like nine to 10%. Um, that's how I know like, okay, that's, that, this video is going to do well. If it's, if it's, you know, six, five, that video typically isn't going to do super well. Um, you know, in terms of watch time, my average watch time is around four minutes and 30 seconds, which is good. Um, 
but it really depends on on you your video how long your videos are my videos are typically around the eight to ten minute mark and so you know it's really about it's about set and what happens is you set a benchmark in your specific on your specific channel it really doesn't matter what i get versus what you get it's about you and your audience and so it's about you putting it out there and consistently youtube will basically learn what your audience responds to and how it basically tracks and then you can log into your creative studio and see exactly how that video is tracking and um and so yeah if you if you have if you have a high click through rate and high watch time that is sort of like the holy grail of 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 videos because you know okay if it had a high watch time for my audience it had a high click through rate youtube knows okay well this is probably something that other people may be interested we're going to test it and if it also has a high click through rate that's when videos go really nuts and and do really well in terms of views mm. yeah that's a gold man thank you for sharing because i know some creators aren't always uh, open around what they aim ah, for shit, i don't care yeah <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to know <laughs> uh, awesome yeah because it just gives people a good baseline to kind of aim for but you're only as good as your last video so really it's about okay, well, my CTR is five, 6%. How do I get it to seven for the next one? And just keep building upon that. And is that what you've found over the past 14 years? Like you've just kept getting better and better and trying to boost those metrics. It's not about getting, it's not about getting better and better. It's about, <laughs> it's about just trying to do better than, than, I mean, when you look at, when, when you're looking at in your creator studio, you basically have a, a ranking of your last 10 videos, right? And it's going to show you, all right, out of the last 10 videos where this video falls. And so it's amazing how accurate and how, how consistent things actually are. You know, if, if, I mean, you almost, in the first hour, I can tell you exactly within like 3,000 views, how many views my video, that video is going to get within that 24 hour period. I mean, it's, it, you get really good at, at, at gauging and understanding. And so, you know, for me, it's just been about adjusting and learning because the algorithm, you know, they talk about the algorithm all the time. It is constantly evolving and changing. Your audience is constantly changing and evolving. It would be great if YouTube kept everything consistent. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. And so, you know, on paper, it sounds good that, oh, well, you can just keep, you know, just keep tracking your CPA or your C your click through rate and your watch time. Well, that's fine if we were if we were operating in a vacuum. But YouTube and the algorithm and the way that they are constantly changing and manipulating things, it is not a vacuum. And so you're basically trying to just keep up and 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 stay relevant and put out content that you think your audience likes. Sometimes you hit it and it's great, but a lot of times you'll try something, your audience audience doesn't respond. And that's something that is really hard to wrap your brain around. You'll put out a video that you think is amazing. You put in time, you put in energy, you put in money. You're like, this is awesome. And your audience doesn't watch it. It's like, what? And, and it, it can be demoralizing, right? Because you put so much time and energy, but then something, I, I joke, like, it's like fast food. It's like you're presenting and preparing this gourmet meal and they just want a cheeseburger. And so then you put out a cheeseburger and they're like, oh, this is great. And you're like, oh, here we go again. And, and what ends up happening is you end up chasing that, that sort of metric. You chase that sort of that topic, the title, the thumbnail, because you, are, you get addicted to the feedback and the validation that comes with you know, the good videos. And when you put out a bad one, it for me, I'm in this 13, 14 years, it still affects me horribly and i think to an unhealthy level when you start putting your passion and your your every you know you start making this a job and a career and you start really you know diving into this you know you you invest so much of not only your time and your energy but your emotional bandwidth and when it doesn't perform or things don't do well or your audience says hey i'm not really interested in this video it really affects you. At least it affects me. I have not been able to just be like, eh, whatever, even though you just got to put out another one. But on the flip side, when you put out a video that does well, I'm like, yeah, like it, it your day is made, right? You feel incredible, but there's always that next one that's coming. And uh, you just, you just cross your fingers and hope that it's going to, it's going to go well. Yeah. I, I appreciate the transparency around this obsession that is clearly required 
to build, you know, a 6 million plus YouTube channel over the past 14 plus years, right? Like if you, if it didn't, if you didn't care, you wouldn't be optimizing and obsessing and learning the way you are to get you where you are today. Would, would you say that's a great, a good way to break it down? Absolutely. Yeah, there, there, it, it does. I mean, it becomes a bit of an obsession and you've got to be a student and you've got to understand. And that's, that's the crazy thing. You know, just when you think you have it figured out, you know, I've been doing this for many years, lots of subscribers. I've had some successes. I've had some not successes and I still don't have it figured out. I think it's, it's something, it's kind of like golf, right? Where, you know, you practice and practice and practice and, and you're good, but you're never, you never shoot the perfect game. Like there's always things that you're trying to learn and improve. And then just when you do really well on that specific course, the course changes and you got to start over again. And so I think golf is a good analogy for YouTube. You know, sometimes you hit great right off the, the fairway and sometimes you shank it into the woods and you got to go find your ball. Yeah. Okay. I get you. Um, so uh, we have to work towards wrapping up a uh, couple last questions. One, um, what would you say to someone that is considering to start a YouTube channel now? Do it. There's absolutely no reason not to. Now, Two things you need to know. Number one, it is not easy, but it is possible. The other thing you need to know is that, you know, if you're going to put yourself out there, realize that, you know, people, it's not always fun in terms of the feedback. You know, you've got to prepare yourself that you're going to hear some things or people may comment. I, and I joke with, with people, I say, you know, you could literally be teaching blind kittens to read and somebody would have a problem with it. They will, you know, say that you look stupid or, or whatever it is. I mean, I literally today have insecurities that I never had before, but because of YouTube and putting yourself out there, you know, you, you, you open yourself up to, you know, criticism, which is not easy to hear and take it from somebody that's been doing it for 14 years. I still have not done this long enough or figured out a way to have skin thick enough that it doesn't affect me. You know, because I think we, we, we want to do a really good job. And so you are going to open yourself up to, you know, criticism. But understand this also, that the people that are criticizing aren't doing it. And if you can persevere and if you can basically allow yourself to continue. And, and the other thing is the, the, the positive comments far outweigh the negative. And so, you know, surround yourself and try not to obsess with the comments try to really stay focused on your goal and what you're trying and striving to do and you'll be all right. But just understand it's not easy and there are some horrible people out there in the world. <laughs> and, and putting somebody, you know, in a keyboard that's anonymous is uh, gives somebody the, uh, the, the, the courage to say, you know, to say terrible things, but don't let it, don't let it get to you too much. Hmm. And what, what's the number one thing like in terms of mistakes that you see creators make? Uh, stopping, honestly. I, I think that, that, that when you stop putting out content or you get really lax with your consistency, I think that is the ultimate, you know, kind of like kiss of death, if you will, in terms of you lose a lot of steam, you lose a lot of trajectory, YouTube, you know, stops recommending you as much. And so I think that if you're going to do it, commit, you know, commit to it, commit to a year, commit to, you know, six months, whatever it is, but just give yourself enough time to have successes and failures and just something that you can, you know, basically analyze and, and look at to really have a good track record. But I think the biggest mistake is people just, you know, they, they expect success to come quicker. And so they stop when you are, you never know where that next video is going to be. It could always go viral. I mean, you could be one video away from, you know, exponential growth. Yeah. I love it. And uh, just on the sales piece, um, for anyone that's looking to start a YouTube channel now and to generate sales, what are the things that you are seeing that work right now? I think it's two different things. So AdSense, you know, that's, that's, that's fine. But, you know, the, the truth is you need a crazy amount of views in order to really generate, you know, in, you know good money in terms of, of you know, your AdSense, you need a lot of views, say, you know, and, and, but that being said, it also depends on what niche you're in, you know, people that are in the finance niche, they make a huge, you know, CPA, you know, people in my space, it's 
five dollars per thousand impressions and so you know you need think about that for for every thousand views you, know, you might make five dollars whereas you know somebody like a Graham Stephan or somebody in the finance space is 100, 150. I mean, it, it, is, it is crazy how, how different it is. Um, and so for me, what I have found is that I make a lot more money in terms of revenue through sponsorships, also through selling my own products. And so if you're looking to sort of make money on this, you definitely, I think, need to be able to figure out a way to diversify your, your revenue streams. You know, the AdSense is great, like fine. That's, you know, kind of, you know, you're doing it, you're posting content, but relying on that for your money is, is tricky, I would say, because you never know when things are going to change or you're going to fall out of your, or the algorithm is going to fall out of love with you. And, um, and so you also have no ability to kind of reach out to your customer if they're, everybody is still on YouTube. And so try to get them off of YouTube somewhere else so that you can build a list, you can build you know, you know, a mailing list, or you can have them purchase something else or some auxiliary product that, that you're creating or coming up with. I would say that's something that you see a lot of creators. You know, when they start, it's just YouTube, but then very quickly, the smart ones try to diversify so that they can have alternate you know, revenue streams and things of that nature. Yeah, look, that makes sense. And we're seeing that more than ever. Um, so look, we have to work towards wrapping up. We'll move to the hot seat round. Uh -oh. I'm gonna ask uh -oh. you four questions, uh -oh. uh, 30 uh -oh. second answers. Um, so what's the craziest encounter you've ever had with someone from your audience? Oh, um, it's not necessarily, well, there have been some crazy ones, but the things that always are weird is when I'm at a urinal at a, like in a bathroom, public bathroom, and somebody will look next to me and I'll see somebody like looking at me. And typically like guys will like want to like give me a knuckle bump while we're sitting there like peeing. That's a little bit weird. <laughs> so that's just a little awkward, but, uh, but yeah, that was, uh, that was, that's always, that's always fun. <laughs> that's crazy so what's one who's like who's one creator that's constantly inspiring you and uh really you know making you want to make your content better i would say graham stefan is somebody that i really admire and look up to he's uh in the finance space but he has really done an incredible job leveraging his content, his audience, what he's doing, and the way that he kind of looks at things and creates videos and thumbnails. I think he does an amazing job. And so he's definitely one that, that inspires me greatly. Yeah, awesome. I love him too. Um, if you were to step into the ring with anyone because this big YouTube boxing space is a thing, who would it be and why? <laughs> God, um, who would I box? Oh God, I, uh, that is a, that is a, I'm, I'm a pacifist. I don't know. Um, let me think about that real quick. Um, who would I box? Uh, I, th this one, I, I can't even, I have no idea. Who would you box? Nathan, who would you box? <laughs> I don't know, man. Gary V. Yeah, like who? <laughs> Gary V. Who? Yeah, Gary V. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gary V's a good one. Yeah, he makes me feel like a loser. So I'll, I'd box Gary V. That's a good one. He always makes me feel like I'm not working or doing anything. <laughs> he makes me feel lazy. <laughs> All right, last one. If you could have dinner with an entrepreneur or a creator. Who would it be and why, dead or alive? Um, entrepreneur, dead or alive. Probably um, one of the, one of the like the Ro Rockefeller, honestly. Um, Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, all those guys, you know, back at the turn of the century that really had a big impact on, you know, the development of our, not only my country, but also, you know, the world. Um, you know, just when I, when I read and hear about what they have done at such a young age, because that's the interesting thing. You know, a lot of these guys like the Rockefellers, Carnegie's, Vanderbilt's, Edison's, they were young. They were literally like in their 20s and 30s when they, you know, created these mega, ultra, crazy, successful companies. And they were visionaries. And just to have that sort of mentality and that drive and that belief in yourself, I find that absolutely 
spectacular. And so it would definitely be one of the titans of industry if I could go and have dinner with one of them just to pick their brain and, and uh, just hear how they think. Because these people, people like that, they think differently than people like at least me. And uh, I find that absolutely fascinating. Oh, that's awesome, man. Yes, I agree. Um, look, well, dude, this was an incredible interview. You just gave us like a a YouTube masterclass on how to get millions of subscribers. Maybe that's our thumbnail. Maybe that's our title. But man, that's what, there it was, is. That, that was awesome. Thank you so much for your time, brother. Awesome, Nathan. Have a great evening. Hey, founder fam. Did you love this interview? Well, if you did, then make sure to subscribe. We're dropping new interviews every single week, and we can't wait for you to join the journey. All right, we'll see you soon.